Consider this apparently uninteresting rolling object. This rolling object has dots of various colors attached on both sides. Consider the paths that these dots take through space. These paths form a beautiful pattern that can be considered a work of art. These paths also teach us something very important. Notice how the red dots momentarily stop before continuing. The velocity of each red dot is the sum of the velocity due to the rotation, represented by the red arrow, plus the velocity due to the forward motion of the object represented by the white arrow. These two arrows exactly cancel each other out when the red dot is at the bottom. In order to visualize what is happening, consider the treads of a tank. As the tank moves forward, the bottom of each tread is standing still. In exactly the same way, the bottom of any wheel rolling on a surface is standing still relative to the surface, provided that there is no sliding or skidding. The only difference with our original example is that we added outer wheels which do not touch the surface. It's only the red dots that are standing still at the bottom because it is only the red dots that represent the inner part of the wheel which is actually rolling on the surface. Okay, today we start with uh, chapter 11, our second chapter on uh, rotational motion. And there are uh, three main topics in this chapter, as the title says. It's about rolling, torque, and angular momentum. So these are the three topics we will consider in this chapter. Today we will uh, consider the first one, which is rolling motion. Rolling motion is a very important type of motion. Its applications include the rolling of wheels, which as we know is very important for the motion of vehicles such as bicycles, cars and airplanes. We will start our discussion of the rolling motion by looking at the uh, following video, which is a very illustrative video that shows us the complexity of this type of motion. Many students wonder what the path of a point on a wheel rolling without slip would look like. Today we're going to explore that in a little more. We have a spool that will roll without slip on its inner radius on this track here. 
subtract points on it, we have LEDs. So the yellow is exactly on the inner radius of the spool. And anything inside of that will act exactly like a wheel rolling without slip. The outer points will have more interesting paths that we will also track. All of the curves traced will belong to the cycloid family of curves. The first curve is traced with the green LED at the spool center. Since the center of the spool should always be one inner radius from the track, the path is traced as a straight line with slight variations from the curve of the track. The purple LED is between the spool's center and its inner radius. All such points will trace curtate cycloids, which look a bit like elongated sine curves, and will vary depending on the exact distance. The yellow LED is located exactly on the inner radius of the spool. It traces out a cycloid, where you can notice distinct cusps once every rotation. This is when the light has zero velocity, as it is at the no-slip point and instant center of the spool. So this is how we will go through our study of uh, rolling motion. We will first study the kinematics of rolling motion. Then we will see how to calculate the kinetic energy of a rolling object. And then we will study the relationship between frictional forces and rolling motion. And finally, as a special case, we will consider uh, rolling of a round object down an inclined plane. So let's start with the first one, the kinematics of rolling motion. Here we consider all the objects that roll smoothly. Okay, This is the condition we will work under, objects that roll smoothly, which means that the object rolls without slipping, there is no slipping, no sliding, on the surface and without bouncing on the surface. That's what we call smooth rolling. The figure here, this is what we saw in the video. The, video, uh, the, the figure shows how complicated smooth rolling motion can be. This is the cycloid that we saw in the video. The center of the object moves in a straight line. That's the orange color here. Moves in a straight line parallel to the surface, parallel to the surface. A point on the rim, on the edge of the uh, rotating object, certainly does not move in a straight line, but it moves in this very complicated path that is called a cycloid. However, despite the complexity of this path, we can study this motion by treating it, treating rolling motion, as a combination, as a superposition, as a sum of translation and rotation translation of the center of mass of the object and rotation of the rest of the object around the center of the object. Suppose you are standing on a sidewalk watching the bicycle wheel as it rolls. So you are here and there is this bicycle wheel rolling on, uh, on a level road. You see the center of mass, point O, of the wheel moves forward at constant speed v com. The point P on the street where the wheel makes contact with the street also moves forward at speed v com so that P always remains below O. So if you focus on these two points, you will find that the center of mass moves in a straight line with constant speed v com. This point where the, the, the wheel makes contact with the road, we will call it point P, also moves, it's always below O, so if O moves with constant speed V com, P will move in the same way, with constant speed that is equal to V com. This is the case of smooth rolling, if we don't have sliding. During some time interval T, you see that both O and P move forward a distance S which is equal to V multiplied by T. The bicycle rider, on the other hand, will see the following. Let's say that we have a very big wheel, like this one. The rider is here. He doesn't see the translational motion of the wheel. What, we, what he will see is just the rotation of the wheel. So the bicycle rider sees the wheel 
rotates, he will also only see the rotational motion of the wheel. He will see the wheel rotate through an angle theta, like this one here, about the center of the wheel, with the point of the wheel that was touching the street at the beginning of the time t moving through an arc length. So the linear distance of O and P becomes an arc, an angle for the bicycle rider. With this now, we can relate uh, the two sets of variables, and that will enable us to study the dyna uh, sorry, the kinematics of this type of motion, where we relate the distances and the speeds involved with this type of motion. And this is really not something totally new, it is something we have seen back in chapter 10. So this is now section one, in which we want to study rolling motion. Looking at the geometry we have here, how do we relate S uh, with theta? That's something we did in chapter 10. The arc length S is equal to R multiplied by theta. Where theta again is measured in radians. Let's differentiate this equation with respect to time. So we have ds by dt is equal to r d theta by dt. What is ds by dt? Uh, it is this distance divided by the time, which is equal to the linear speed of the center of mass. So ds by dt is simply equal to the linear speed of the center of mass. Simple straight line one dimensional motion. d theta by dt, as we studied in chapter 10, is nothing but the angular speed of the wheel. And therefore, the two are related by v calm is equal to r omega. And this is the equation that we need with regard to the kinematics of rolling motion. Now, let us have a look at rolling motion. As we said, we will treat it as a combination of translation and rotation. And that is shown in here. So here is pure rotation, where the wheel just rotates without any linear movement. And here we have pure translation, where the wheel translates as a unit without any kind of rotation. Add the two together, and you get the rolling motion, which is the combination of the two. So let's analyze each one of them separately. Starting with the first one, figure A, shows the purely rotational motion. That's what we studied in chapter 10, as if the rotation axis through the center of mass were stationary. Every point on the wheel rotates about the center with angular speed omega. That's what we said in chapter 10. The object and any point on it uh, will have the same theta, omega, and alpha. So here we are talking about omega. Every point on the outside edge, on the rim, will have linear speed v com. Why? Because this point has a linear speed of r multiplied by omega, and that's nothing but the speed of the center of mass, what we call the speed of the center of mass, although the center of mass is not moving in here. But the product r omega, we call it Figure B shows the purely translational motion. You take the wheel and just slide it without any rotation, as if the wheel did not rotate at all. Now you have an object moving as a unit with a speed v com. So every point in the object will have the same speed v com, like we see in here. All points will move with the same speed. Now we add the two to give us the rolling motion. So add them point by point. At the top point, T, top, V plus V will give us 2V. At the center, 0 plus V will give us V. At the point of contact, P, minus V plus V will give us 0. A very, very strange result is taking place in here. So the combination of A and B yields the rolling motion that is shown in C, which is what we have in here. Highest speed, medium speed, no speed at all. 
So in the running motion, the portion of the wheel at the, at the bottom, which is point P, is stationary. It's not moving at all. The portion at the top, T, is moving at speed 2V calm, the highest speed, faster than any other portion of the wheel. So the speeds are not the same at different points of the wheel. These results are demonstrated by the time exposure of a rolling wheel that is shown below. So here is a real picture, okay, uh, of a rolling wheel, and this is just one instant image. And you can see exactly what we are saying in here. The bottom point P, you can clearly see the spikes of the bicycle, which means that this point is moving very slowly with zero speed. Here we don't see the spikes, they are speed, uh, they are smeared away because these points here are moving with very high speed, so you cannot see the individual spikes. And that's indeed what we saw in the video. We saw this behavior in here, and if you go back to the video, you will see uh, the person saying that this is the point with zero velocity. That's exactly what we have here. Very similar to this is what happens in free fall. In free fall, if you reach the maximum height, the particle will momentarily stop at that point and then come back to the ground. So what is happening there? The velocity changes from being upward to downward. At that point of change, the velocity is zero, and that's exactly what we have here. Zero velocity, positive velocity, and the point of inflection will have zero velocity. So that's about the uh, kinematics of rolling motion. Now let's move to the second point we want to consider, which is how to calculate the kinetic energy of a rolling body. If it were just translating, it is one half in V squared. If it were just rotating, it will be one half I omega squared. But now we have both types of rotation, uh, both types of motion. So how do we calculate the kinetic energy of a rolling body? The way to do it is we play this trick. We will take the axis of rotation. You can take the axis of rotation anywhere you like. You can take it naturally to be through the center of mass, okay, like we have in here. Or we can now play a trick and take the axis of rotation to be here, through point P, the point of contact with the ground. Why is that? Why is that convenient? because this point is not moving, it is stationary. So if you put an axis here, it will be a stationary axis, and therefore you just have rotation, you don't have translation. And therefore the kinetic energy about this axis will only be one half i omega squared. There is no one half mv squared because v is zero. Only thing you have to watch is that the i in this equation, the, the rotational inertia will be the rotational inertia about this axis, not through the center of mass. So with this in mind, let's see how to calculate the kinetic energy of a rolling object. Taking the axis of rotation to be at point P, like we said, the kinetic energy will be as follows. So if we take the axis to pass through point P, point P in this discussion is the point of contact with the uh, ground, then we only have rotational kinetic energy, we don't have mv squared because v at P is zero, so the kinetic energy is one half i through P multiplied by omega squared. Now we want to work on this. What is IP? It is the rotational inertia about this point. The parallel axis theorem, here is the axis at P, and here is the axis through the center of mass. The parallel axis theorem says the rotational inertia about this axis is equal to the rotational inertia about the center of mass plus the distance between the two axes, which is equal to the radius of the wheel. So it is equal to m r squared. What about omega? Omega is there. Omega is equal to 
V comp divided by I. So let's come back to the equation for K. Therefore, K is equal to one half IP, which is I comp plus M R squared. multiplied by omega squared, which is V com squared, divided by R squared. And that will be equal to one half I com V com squared over R squared, plus one half M R squared will cancel, and we have V com squared. Let me put this back as omega, and therefore the kinetic energy for rolling object is equal to one half I com omega squared plus one half M V com squared, which is a very simple and convenient equation for the kinetic energy of a rolling object. What does it say? It says, that the kinetic energy of the sum of two kinetic energies. The first one is this one. This is the rotational kinetic energy about the center of mass. And this is the translational, one half mv squared, the translational kinetic energy of the center of mass of the object. So, you just replace the object as one point, the center of mass, moving with one half in V squared. And then the rest of the object is rotating about that point with this much kinetic energy, and the total will be the sum of the two. So that's simply how we calculate the kinetic energy of a rolling object. Now we want to discuss the relationship between frictional forces and uh, rolling motion. You can imagine, we will see the discussion now, but very simply, very simply, you can imagine from uh, our daily experience, from uh, uh, watching TV programs, that if we don't have friction, like on an icy road, the cars cannot move, the car's wheels cannot roll on the road. To have them rolling and moving naturally, we must have friction with the road, otherwise they will not roll. So that's simply the relationship between friction and uh, rolling motion. Let's discuss that in detail. If a net force acts on a rolling wheel, you have to, to read these sentences very carefully. We have a wheel that is already uh, uh, rolling. It's not we want to start it rolling. It's already rolling and we apply a force to it. So. If a net force acts on a rolling wheel to speed it up or slow it down, then the net force causes acceleration A comp. This is uh, Newton's second law. Uh, if net is equal to MA, so if you increase or apply a net force, there will be a corresponding acceleration of the center of mass of the, uh, of the wheel along the direction of travel. It also causes the wheel to rotate faster or slower which means it causes an angular acceleration of the wheel. Remember that these two are connected. A comp is equal to R alpha. These accelerations tend to make, to make the wheel slide at V. So the wheel is rolling. If you apply this force, that force will try to slide the wheel at the point of contact with the road. <clears throat> and therefore, to avoid this tendency of sliding, a frictional force must also act on the wheel at point P at the point of contact to oppose that tendency of sliding. If the wheel does not slide, which is what we are studying here, the force is a static friction. Why is it static? Because the point P is at rest. It has zero velocity. So the force of friction there is a static frictional force and the motion is smooth rolling, which is what we are considering. The linear and angular accelerations are related by A com is equal to alpha R. If the wheel does slide, when the net force acts on it, the frictional force that acts at point P will be a kinetic frictional force. Although that case is possible, 
we are not studying it here because we will focus only on smooth rolling. The motion then in that case is not smooth rolling and will not be discussed in here. Now we will consider uh, a special case and that is of a round object rolling down an inclined plane. So here is what we are considering. We consider a round body which could be a sphere or a cylinder, it is round, of mass, capital M, radius capital R, rolling down around an inclined plane of angle theta along an x-axis. And we would take the x-axis to be the plane, uh, the ramp, with uh, the positive direction pointing upward. What do we want to find here? We want to find an expression for A calm x, the acceleration of the center of mass down the ramp. Now, in chapter five, we said if you have an object sliding down an inclined plane, sliding, not rolling, what's the acceleration? I hope you remember that equation. A is equal to G sine of theta, okay? We did that case. Now, what happens if we have rolling, if we have rotation? How does this equation change? That's what we want to see now. So, like any dynamical problem, we will start by uh, considering the forces acting on the object, draw its free body diagram, identify the forces, and proceed from there, applying the linear or angular form of Newton's second law. In this case, our object is the wheel. Okay, the forces acting on it, there are three forces. The force of gravity, the gravitational force, mg, that acts at the center of the object. And then we have the normal force due to the inclined plane, and it is perpendicular to the plane. Its point of application is point B, that is this point here. And the third force is the force of static friction up the incline opposite to uh, the direction of motion of the disc. So we will first write F is equal to MA for these to analyze the linear motion. And then we will write tau is equal to I alpha to analyze the rotational motion. With this now, let's start with the linear form of Newton's second law. This is uh, now section two, rolling down around or an inclined plane. So Newton's second law for the rotational, for the linear motion says, remember that this is the positive direction of the x-axis, so the force of friction is positive, the horizontal component of gravity will be in the negative direction. So it will be Fs minus mg sine of theta is equal to m a calm. Of course, this is negative because it is in that direction. So this is what we get from the linear form of Newton's second law. Now we want to apply the angular form of Newton's second law. The angular form, remember, tau net is equal to i multiplied by alpha. Now, which of these forces, one, two, and three, which of the three produces torque? Well, to answer that question, you have to define the axis of rotation, about which you calculate the torque. You can take it anywhere you like, but the most convenient is to take it to be at the center of the object. So let's take our axis of rotation to be there like that. Now, which of the three forces will exert torque about that point? Remember that the torque due to a force is equal to Rf sine of phi. So let's look at the gravitational force. You can clearly see that the gravitational force will not exert any torque about this point because its point of application is right at the center of, uh, of rotation is right on the axis of rotation, so the distance R is zero, and therefore this will not produce any torque. What about the normal force? 
Here is the point of application of the normal force, and there is the axis of rotation. There is a distance r between them. But now what about the angle? Here is the vector r, and that's the force. The two are parallel to each other. r goes from the point of application to the axis of rotation, so that's the vector r, which is along the force. The angle is zero, sine of zero is zero. So these two forces will not produce any torque about this axis. What about the force of friction? This is the only force remaining. Here is the point of application of friction, and that's the axis of rotation. There is a distance r between them. Now what about the angle? This is r, and that's the force. The angle is 90 degrees. So yes, this will produce torque about that point, and the angle is 90 degrees, so its torque is equal to Fs multiplied by r. And therefore, what we have for the rotational motion is that r times Fs, that's the only force that produces a torque, is equal to I calm now. Let's remember that we took the axis of rotation to be at the center multiplied by alpha. Okay, so these are the two equations. Now remember how the accelerations are related. They are related by alpha is equal to A over R, which we can write here as alpha is equal to minus a calm divided by r. A is the acceleration of the center of mass, r is there, but now why do we have the negative sign? Because the acceleration of the center of mass is negative, it's in the negative x direction. Alpha, it is rotating counterclockwise, so alpha is positive. A is negative, alpha is positive, and that is accounted for by uh, this negative sign here. So with this now, taking alpha from here to here, we will have Fs, the force of static friction, is equal to I calm into this, which will be minus I calm, A calm, divided by R squared. There is this R and that R. So that is our fourth equation. And now we are set. All what we have to do is take the force of static friction back into equation one. So from four to one, taking four to one, what we have is the uh, acceleration of the center of mass. Substitute there, we leave the terms and so for A, you will find it to be minus, it's in the negative x direction, g sine of theta divided by one plus i calm divided by m r squared. And that's the equation we are looking for. Okay, you can see that if it is just sliding, it is g sine of theta. But now if we have rotation, there is this extra term that comes from the rotation of the object. And that's the case of rolling down or even up an inclined plane. The next section is section 11.3, in which uh, the book discusses the UU. I treat the UU as a subject in chapter 10. Uh, simply, I will apply tau is equal to I alpha, tau is equal to I alpha to analyze the motion of the UU. And you may see in the solution of the exam problems on chapter two or 10, some problems on the UU and that's how I will do it. Only thing is, which brings it to chapter 11, is that as the UU goes down, the axis of rotation is moving. So that's the subject we have in chapter 11. In chapter 10, it is rotation about and uh, a fixed axis, but as I said, we can treat it with the subject in chapter 10. So this is what we have today. We dealt with the uh, kinematics, energy, friction of rolling motion. Now we will look at examples and problems related to 
the material we have just discussed. And the first thing we will uh, deal with is uh, sample problem 1101, which is an application of rolling down an inclined plane. Now, here we just set a round object. Now we take the round object to be a uniform ball, a solid sphere. So let's see what we have here. The problem says, this is sample problem 1101. It says, a uniform ball, a solid sphere of mass 6 kilograms and radius r, rolls smoothly from rest down a ramp at an angle of 30 degrees. The ball descends a vertical height. The, the, the vertical distance it goes down is 1.2 meters to reach the bottom of the ramp. What is the speed at the bottom? Now, he is looking for the speed. You can do the problem by dynamics, find the acceleration of the center of mass, and then apply chapter two, motion with constant acceleration, to find the speed, or you can use conservation of energy. Either way will give you the speed. Here I will use the conservation of energy because we dealt with the dynamics. Now let's see the conservation of energy. How does it work with rolling motion? And then we will continue with part B. So uh, we will do part A using the law of conservation of mechanical energy. Okay, I will take my reference to be the lowest point, okay. the reference of potential energy to be uh, the bottom of the ramp with that u final will be zero. u initial, you just treat it like a point, so it will be mgh. What is h? There it is. Now what about k? k initial is equal to zero. It rolls from rest. K final. At the bottom of the incline, this is a rolling object, so it will be one half I com omega squared, the rotational kinetic energy, plus the translation, one half M V com squared. What is the speed? Means the speed of the center of mass. So you either change Omega to V or V to Omega depends on what you want. Here we want the speed. So I change this to V. One half times I com. What is I for a solid sphere? We go back to table 10 2. Where is the solid sphere? This is a shell. This is a solid sphere. Its rotational inertia about the center of mass is 2 over 5 mR squared. So times 2 over 5 m r squared and omega is v com squared over r squared plus one half m v com squared now this will cancel that the r squared will cancel we have one over five which is 0.2 plus one half which is 0.5 so that will be 0.7 m V com squared. If it were just sliding down, it will be 0.5 mv squared. But now we have the extra 0.2 coming from the rotational part. Now apply conservation of mechanical energy. K initial plus U initial is equal to K final plus U final. U final is zero. K initial is zero. So these are equal. K final is 0.7 m v com squared is equal to u initial which is m g h cancel the m and solve for v com that will be equal to g h divided by 0.7 under the square root h is there 1.2 put it here and get the answer that will be 4.1 meters per second and that's the speed part b what are the magnitude and direction of the frictional force on the ball well the magnitude the direction it's up the incline what's the magnitude of the 
frictional force. Then we have to calculate the acceleration. And the acceleration, according uh, to this equation, is g sine of theta, g sine of theta, divided by 1 plus i com, here is i com, 0.4, 2 over 5 is 0.4, so 0.4 m r squared over m r squared. Cancel these, and it will be g sine of theta divided by 1.4, that's a. And now, what is the frictional force? There is the frictional force. The frictional force is equal to F S is equal to 1 over R squared times I comb, which is 0.4 MR squared. That's this one, times A. There it is. So the R squared will cancel, and we have 0.4 ma, 0.4 m times a, which is equal to, there is a, so it will be 0.4 mg, 0.4 mg sine of theta divided by 1.4. Theta is 30 degrees, yes, 30 degrees, put it in here, and you will find that the magnitude of the frictional force is equal to 8.4 newtons. Uh, 0.4 mg. Yes, 0 0.4 to There is the frictional force. Let's take now a similar problem to rolling down an inclined plane. And this is this problem from the textbook. It's again rolling on a plane, but with two differences. In the example we have just done, it was a solid sphere. Now it is a spherical shell or a sphere. And in the example we just did, it is rolling down an inclined plane. But in the problem, the sphere is rolling up. So it's like a bowling ball. You slide it and it rolls up the inclined plane. So these are the differences. Let's read the problem. It says a hollow sphere, spherical shell, of radius 1.15 meters with rotational inertia. We have already given the rotational inertia, 0.048 kilogram meter square, about a line through its center of mass, rolls without slipping up a surface inclined at 30 degrees to the horizontal. At a certain initial position, the sphere's total kinetic energy is 20 joules. Okay? So at the beginning, uh, uh, when it is on the horizontal, before going to the inclined plane, its total kinetic energy is 20 joules. How much of this initial kinetic energy is rotational? Okay? So we will first uh, deal with what we are given, get as much information as we need out of it, and then proceed to answer the question. <clears throat> so we first note that I come for a holosphere Going back to the table, let's read the uh, ICOM. Here is a spherical shell, means hollow or empty sphere. It is 2 over 3 mR squared. 2 over 3 mR squared. From which mR squared is 3 ICOM over 2. Okay, 3 over 2. And I will call this equation 1. And therefore, the mass of the sphere, which is not given, is equal to 3i com over 2r squared, which will be 3 times, let's go back to the problem, uh, what is i com? There it is, 
0 0.048 over 2 times uh, where is the radius? Oh, uh, yeah, the radius is 0 0.15, so 0 0.15 squared, and that will give me the mass of the sphere as 3.2 kilograms. Okay, here I have the mass. Now, let's go to the problem. The problem says if the initial kinetic energy is 20 joules while it is on the level, on the horizontal, how much of this 20 is rotational? So we write the equation for the total kinetic energy, K total, is equal to K rotational plus K translational. And that will be equal to one half I com omega squared plus one half M V com squared. And like we said before, you either change V to omega or omega to V. In this case, he is talking about the rotational part. So I'll change V to omega, and that will be equal to, how much is that? That will be one half I com omega squared plus one half M V is R omega. So it will be omega R, that's V com multiplied or, or squared. That will be one half I com omega squared plus one half M R squared into omega squared. What is M R squared? There it is. So I put that in here and that will be one half I com omega squared plus one half times three over two i com omega squared. Now this is one half from here plus three over four from here, right? Uh, multiply by two, that would be two plus three is five. So it would be five over four and the rest is the same. I omega squared. I can rewrite this as 5 over 2 times 1 half I com omega squared, isn't it? That would be 5 over 4. But what is this? This is the rotation of kinetic energy. So this is 5 over 2 K rotational. And therefore, K rotational take this to that side, will be 2 over 5 k total. So how much of this is rotational? If the total is 20, then the rotational part of it will be, this will be 8, this will be 8 joules. The total is 20 joules, 8 will come from the rotational part, and 12 will come from the translational part. Part B, what is the speed of the center of mass of the sphere at the initial position? What is the speed at the initial position? <coughs> For that, we will go to uh, this equation here, okay? And let's see what we have, K total. K total is equal to 5 over 4 I com omega squared, which is 5 over 4 I com V com squared over R squared. So V com squared, 4 R squared, 4 R squared, K total divided by 5 I com. And therefore, V com, take the square root. The square root of this is 2R, and then K total over 5 I com under the square root. And if we put the numbers, we know the radius, 0.15, 
k total 20 because we are talking about the initial speed i com is there so put all of these and you will find that the initial speed is 2.7 meters per second then the problem says what are its total kinetic energy and the speed when it has moved one meter up the incline now the the sphere will start to roll up the inclined plane if it rolls up a distance d which is one meters one meter up the incline means on the incline how high is that well you can see that sine of theta is h over d so h is d sine of theta and that would be the distance moved is one meter sine of theta theta is 30 degrees yes so h is 0.5 meters now apply conservation of energy to find the uh, total kinetic energy so for that we apply conservation of me mechanical energy taking the reference to be the initial position on the ground and therefore k initial plus u initial is equal to k final plus u final okay u initial is zero that's where we have our level and therefore k final is equal to k initial minus u final which is k initial minus m g multiplied by h this is equal to 20 k initial minus m we found m here that's why we did that 3.2 times 9.8 times h one half and that will be uh, a value of 4.32 joules that's the kinetic energy when it has moved to uh, by one meter up the incline what's the speed at that point well let me say that this equation is a star so using a star using star okay only thing you have to change is to put k total which is 4.32 and then you will find that the speed of the center of mass when it has moved one meter up the incline will be 1.27 meters per second. Compare that to the initial, which was 2.7. My addition to this problem is this. What is the direction of the frictional force? Well, say that the object rolling down, the frictional force was up the incline. Now, if it is going up, where is the frictional force? Well, think about it, you will find that the frictional force will still be up the inclined plane. To see that, look at alpha, the angular acceleration. In this case, the object was rolling that way, so alpha is counterclockwise, and the only way for, for us to have the friction to give us counterclockwise angular acceleration is if the uh, frictional force is up the incline. Now, with the object going up, where is omega? Omega is clockwise, it's going up. So omega is clockwise, but it is slowing down. So the angular acceleration is opposite to omega. If omega is clockwise, alpha is counterclockwise, which is exactly like we have in here. So the frictional force will still be up the inclined plane. We will conclude our discussion with this uh, problem from the textbook. It is about uh, the calculation of frictional forces for an object rolling on uh, a horizontal plane. The problem says, in this figure, a constant horizontal uh, force if applied of magnitude 10 newtons is applied to a wheel of mass 10 kilograms and radius 0.3 meters 
the wheel runs smoothly on the horizontal surface and the acceleration of center of mass has a magnitude of 0.6 meters per second squared. In unit vector notation, what is the frictional force on the wheel? So this is very simple, straightforward Newton's second law as we studied it in chapter five. Newton's second law says M A is equal to F net. In unit vector notation, this will be M times A I, the acceleration is in the positive x direction, is equal to the net force. The net force is the sum of the uh, frictional and the net force, uh, the applied force. The applied force is 10 newtons in the positive direction. So this is 10 I, and then we have the frictional force. Okay, wherever it is, we just write it like, like that. So the frictional force is MA minus 10 in the I direction. Now put the numbers. The mass is how much? Uh, 10 kilograms, the acceleration is 0.6. So 10 times 0.6 minus 10 I. And this will be six minus 10, that is minus four I Newtons. So the uh, frictional force has a magnitude of four Newtons in the negative X direction. Part B, what is the rotational energy of the wheel about the rotation axis through its center of mass? If we take the rotation axis here, what will give me a torque? The applied force will not give me a torque because it is acting at the center of rotation. The gravitational force is also acting at the center of rotation. The normal force will have zero angle with the vector R. So the only force that will give me torque about that point is the force of friction. And therefore we have tau is equal to I alpha, tau net is equal to I alpha. This is tau due to the frictional force. And this is now the friction, uh, the rotational energy about the center of mass multiplied by alpha, which is A over R. So the rotational energy about the center of mass is R tau F divided by I, uh, divided by R tau F divided by A. What is the uh, torque due to the frictional force? Well, it is R F sine theta, the theta there is 90 degrees, so that is one, and A, this is F R squared divided by A, and that will be equal to, the frictional force is four, the radius R, are we given? Yes, 0.3 squared, 0 0.09, divided by the acceleration, which is 0.6, so that will give me I come as 0.6, kilogram, kilogram, meter square as the rotational energy of this one. And that is the first lecture we have on uh, chapter uh, 11. And in this lecture, we dedicated the discussion to the analysis of rolling motion. Okay, today we continue our discussion of uh, chapter 11, and we start with a review of what we did in the last lecture, which was dedicated to rolling motion. There we discussed rolling as a combination of translational and rotational motion. We discussed the kinematics of rolling motion. We saw how to calculate the uh, kinetic energy of a rolling object, 
and we also discuss the relationship between frictional forces and rolling motion. Today we continue our discussion of the chapter and uh, what I will do here is I will consider the <coughs> remainder of chapter 11. I will talk about all the remaining ideas in this lecture and I will delay the problems on these ideas to the next lecture. The ideas remaining in the chapter are two main ideas. The first one is the torque on a particle and the second one is the angular momentum. So let's start with the first one. <coughs> In chapter 10, we define the torque on a rigid body rotating about the fixed axis. So it is the torque on a body about an axis. And we saw that it is given by Rf sine of phi. We now expand the definition of torque to apply to an individual particle rather than a body that moves along any path relative to a fixed point. So let's see now, uh, how do we define the, the uh, torque acting on a particle? And for that we consider the figure shown here, in which we have a particle located at one instant of time <coughs> at, at point A in an xy plane. Its position vector relative to the origin is R. And at that point, there is a force F acting on the particle, which makes an angle phi with position vector R. How do we define the torque acting on the particle due to this force? So let's define that. We are now in section four. And here we will define the torque acting on a particle. Having this picture, the torque acting on the particle relative to the origin O shown in the problem, tau, is given as the vector or cross product of the vector R and the force F. The magnitude of this <coughs> Tau is equal to R F sine of phi, where phi is the angle between R and F. This can be written as R F perpendicular or R perpendicular times F. So you either resolve the force into parallel and perpendicular vectors on R, or you resolve R itself into a component perpendicular to the force and a component parallel to the force. In either case, it is the perpendicular component on the other vector. That's the one that will go with the sine of theta. The direction of the uh, torque is given by the right-hand rule. Uh, to apply the right-hand rule, the two vectors must have their tails at the same point. So you either shift F to R or take R and slide it down here so that the two vectors will have the same tail. What is done in the book is that the force is shifted here, as you can see, and now apply the right-hand rule, R cross F will give me the torque, which in this case will be in the positive Z direction. A very important point to note here is that the torque is defined relative to an origin. Okay, if you change the origin, or the reference point, then the vector R will change and therefore the torque will change accordingly. So that is how we calculate the torque acting on a particle. Let's now take an example on the calculation of the torque acting on a particle. And this is sample problem 1102 in the textbook. The uh, example says, in figure A, <coughs> you have to have a very clear three-dimensional view of the problem. In vector A, 
three forces of each of magnitude two newtons act on a particle. The particle is here. And this is how the coordinate axes are given. This is the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. They could be defined in any way as long as x cross y gives me z. That's all we care about, as you can see in here. Uh, so the particle is here. It is in the x-z plane. It's in the xz plane at point A, given by position vector R in the xz plane, where R itself has a magnitude of 3 meters, making an angle of 30 degrees with the positive x-axis. The forces are here, three of them. Each one has a magnitude of 2 newtons. F1 is in the negative x direction. Uh, F2 is in the negative z and F3 is in the negative y. This is positive y, so it is in the negative y. The problem says, what is the torque about the origin due to each force? And one of the best way to do that is to uh, express the vectors in unit vector notation, then it becomes a straightforward matter to carry out the cross product. We first start by expressing R itself. And remember that R is a vector is a, is a vector in the x z plane, so <clears throat> it will be given as R has an x component, and the x component is this component here. It goes with the cosine because that's the adjacent to the x axis, so it will be R cosine of theta. And how much is R? R has a magnitude of 3, making an angle of 30. So it is 3 cosine 30 I plus 3 sine of 30 K. Okay, Z direction. And this will be equal to 2.6 I plus 1.5 K in meters. So that's R. Express the forces now, and the forces are easy to express. They are along the coordinate axis. So let's directly go to the torque itself. And the torque is from this equation. So the torque due to force one is R cross F1. That will be equal to 2.6I plus 1.5 K crossed with F1, magnitude 2, where is F1? F1 is in the negative X, so it will be minus 2I. And now, uh, to carry out this cross product, remember the triangle rule, I, J, and K. If we go in this direction, that will be positive, otherwise it is uh, negative. The cross product of a, vector, of a vector with itself is zero. So I cross I, zero. K cross I, K cross I will give me J. And we have a negative sign here, so it will be minus something J. And how much is that thing? 2.6 times 2 is 5.2. Uh, so that will be, uh, where are we? 2.6, no, no, sorry. This is zero. K cross I is J, so it is something J, and we are multiplying these two, so that will be 3.0 J Newton meter. Tau two is expressed in the same way. It is R cross F two, which will be equal to 2.6 I plus 1.5 K crossed with where is F2? F2 is in the negative Z direction, so minus 2K, minus 2K. And now carry out the cross product. K cross K is zero, so we are left with I cross K. I cross K will be minus J. The minus J will take care of the minus here, so it will be something uh, J. Okay, and how much is it? We're multiplying these two, so it will be 5.2, 5.2, of course, plus 5.2 J in Newton 
meters. Finally, tau 3 is equal to R cross F3, which will be 2.6I plus 1.5K crossed with F3 is in the negative Y direction, so minus 2J. And now what do we have? I cross J, I cross J will give me K, and I have a minus sign, so it is minus something K. How much is that thing? 2.6, 5.2, 5.2K. And then K cross J, K cross J is minus I and have minus here, so it will be plus something I, 1.5 times 2, that is 3.5. Zero I. Only thing is, <coughs> we usually write the I before the K, so it will be 3I minus 5.2K, and these are the three torques acting on this particle due to these forces about the origin. And that's about the torque acting on a particle. We will now move into the second topic we have today, which is the very important concept of angular momentum. We define the linear momentum in chapter nine, P is equal to MV. So now we uh, go into the angular momentum. And if we finish our discussion of the angular momentum, we come to a complete coverage of the correspondence or uh, comparison or analogy of the translational and uh, rotational quantities. This is how we will proceed through the concept of angular momentum. We have many, many ideas now. So let's have an overview of what is ahead. What are we going to discuss with regard to the angular momentum? We will first define the angular momentum of a single particle. And then we will state Newton's second law in angular form, in which we will relate the torque to the angular momentum. And then we will generalize this to define the angular momentum of a system. And then again, we will relate the torque and angular momentum of a system. Then we will find the angular momentum of a rigid body, not a particle, not a system of particles, but a rigid body. And with that, we are in a position to state and consider the very important law of conservation of angular momentum. So these are the things we are coming to now. Let's start with the first idea, which is the angular momentum of a particle. And for that, we consider the uh, geometry shown in here, in which we have a particle <coughs> moving in the xy plane, could be in, in three dimensions. At one instant of time, it, it is located at point A, which has a position vector R relative to the origin O. And at that point, <coughs> it is moving in that direction. Remember, this is the linear momentum. And remember that the linear momentum is M times V. So it has the same direction as the velocity. At that instant of time, it is moving in that direction. And we want now to use these two vectors, R and P, to define the angular momentum of the particle. And the angular momentum is defined in the following way. So this is now section five. And here we will define the angular momentum first for a single particle. The angular momentum of a single particle about the reference point O is defined as follows. It is given the letter L, small m, uh, small l, and it is given as the vector product of the position vector R relative to O and the linear momentum of the particle P. Remember that P is equal to m times V. m is a scalar, take it out of this, and it will be m into R cross V. So this is the angular momentum of a particle relative to an origin. Again, 
This is a vector product. Its magnitude is equal to mr v mr v sine of phi, where phi is the angle between r and v. From which you can see that the SI unit of the angular momentum is kilogram meter square per second. Kilogram meter square per second. The direction of the angular momentum is given by the right hand rule again. So you can shift the vectors as you like. In this figure, it is the momentum that is shift to the origin. And then R plus P will give me the angular momentum that way. Remember again that the angular momentum, just like the torque, are defined relative to a given reference O. If you shift the reference or the origin, these quantities will change. Now, with regard to this, this can be written as R P perpendicular or R perpendicular multiplied by P, okay? Where this symbol here represents the perpendicular component of one vector along the other one or perpendicular to the other one. Let's now take <coughs> an example on uh, the calculation of the angular momentum of particles. And that is uh, sample problem 1103, where we have two, two in a studio of one particle. The problem here says the figure shows an overhead view of two particles. So it is like this. We, have two, we, we are at the top here and the two particles are coming this way, and we are looking from the top. That's what we see. We are here, okay? We are at the top. So it shows an overhead view of two particles moving at constant linear momentum, so they are moving along the straight line. That's the meaning of constant linear momentum, constant velocity, uh, along horizontal paths, horizontal paths parallel to the ground. Particle one with momentum five kilogram meter per second <clears throat> has position vector R1 and will pass two meters from point O. Let's understand this uh, clearly. The uh, position vector of this particle will change as it moves, okay? So it will change as it moves. This is it at another instant of time. And likewise, the position vector of of the second particle will change as it moves. So when we say we'll pass two meters from point O, that means the shortest distance between O and the particle will be two meters. This is the closest it gets, which means that this number corresponds to the perpendicular distance between O and the path of P1. So that's per basically the perpendicular distance, R perpendicular of uh, particle number one. Likewise, particle number two has a linear momentum of two kilogram meter per second and will pass four meters. That is the closest it gets, which means the perpendicular distance from point O. What are the magnitude and direction of the net, the total angular momentum, which we represent by capital L, the individual particle is small L, the total is capital L, about O, about the origin O of the two particle system. Now, in this case, things are given in terms of uh, the perpendicular quantities. So, we will use this one here. Okay, we are given the perpendicular distance. So, we multiply it by the momentum. Only thing is, uh, we have to watch the magnitude. Uh, sorry, the direction. So, the angular momentum of particle number one will be L1 is equal to R perpendicular one times P1, which is two times five, that is 10 kilogram meter square per second. What is the direction of this now? Well, shift the vectors. So let's say that we shift the vector P, shift it down here. So it has the same tail as R1. And now carry out the cross product. It's R cross P. 
So R1 cross P1 will be in the positive Z direction. So that will be in the positive Z, or if you like, out of the page. Likewise, we find the angular momentum of the second particle, it is R perpendicular to times P2, which is the product of these two, two times four, two times four, that would be eight kilogram meter square per second. And now what is the direction? Well, you shift the momentum to the origin and now carry out R cross P. R cross P, we always go to the smaller angle. R cross P will be a vector that is into the page or in the negative Z direction. So that is this one here. Now, the total angular momentum, L, is equal to L1 plus L2. This is plus 10. This is minus 8. So 10 minus 8, that would be plus 2 kilogram meter square per second. The plus means the net angular momentum is in the positive Z direction. So there we have the total angular momentum of these two particles. That will put us now in a position to discuss Newton's second law in its angular form. So let's track what we have. We did this one, angular momentum of a particle. Now we want to express Newton's second law in angular form. To see where we are heading with this one, uh, we will do something uh, similar to what we did in chapters 5 and 9. In chapter 5, in chapter 5, we stated Newton's second law as F is equal to MA. And then in chapter 9, we related the force to the linear momentum. We saw that F is equal to dP by dt. Now we are in rotational motion. So we first related uh, the torque to the acceleration by tau is equal to I alpha. That's what we saw in chapter 10. So now we want to relate the torque to the angular momentum. And that will be the second form of Newton's second law in rotational motion. And that will be the subject of uh, section, section six, okay? <clears throat> so this is now section six, in which we will discuss Newton second law in angular form. And it says that the net torque acting on a particle is equal to, just like this one, take out the force, put the torque, and take out the linear momentum, put the angular momentum. Newton's second law in angular form says the net torque acting on a particle is equal to the rate of change of its angular momentum. In equation form, it is written as tau net is equal to dl by dt. This is the angular form of Newton's second law. Let's prove this one. To prove this one, we will start with the definition of the angular momentum. L is equal to R cross P. And now take its derivative with respect to time. So that would be, we can rewrite this as uh, R cross M V, which is equal to M into R cross V. And now take the derivative. DL by DT is equal to, the mass of the particle is constant, take it out. And we have, apply the chain rule to this one. It will be DR by DT cross V. And then we have R cross DV by DT. This will be 
equal to m into what is dr by dt it is v v cross v plus r cross dv by dt is the acceleration now we know from chapter 3 that the cross product of a vector with itself is zero and we can take the mass into here mass times the acceleration is the force so we have r cross the force and r cross the force is nothing but the torque acting on the particle and that's exactly what we said in here the torque is equal to the time rate of change of the angular momentum of the particle and in this way we related the uh, two quantities, the, uh, the angular momentum and the torque. Next, we will proceed to generalize the definition of the angular momentum of a particle to a system or a group of particles. <clears throat> and that will be the subject of section so here we discuss the angular momentum of a system of a part or a system of particles and the extension or generalization is straightforward the angular momentum of a system which we write as capital L, okay, small l for a particle, capital L for the system, is simply equal to the vector sum of the individual angular momenta of the particles making up the system. So it will be L1 of particle 1 plus L2 of particle 2, and you continue that until you reach the nth or last particle in the system. This can be written compactly as the sum from the first to the nth particle of Li, the individual angular momentum. Now let's take the derivative of the two sides of this equation. dL by dt is equal to the derivative on the other side, which is summation i equal 1 to n dLi by dt. What is that equal to? That's equal to the net torque acting on particle I. So this is equal to N, uh, sorry, I equal one to N of tau net acting on particle number one or particle number I. Now let us discuss what we have here. So here is the equation we got for the rate of change of the total angular momentum of a system. That is equal to the sum of the individual torques acting, acting on the particles. The above net torque that we have in here, the net torque acting on particle I, includes internal torques due to internal forces between the particles and external torques due to forces from bodies external to the system. But remember from uh, Newton's third law that the forces between the particles, the forces between individual particles like particle 2 and 15, particle 3 and 21, the forces between the particles come in pairs and cancel each other equal in magnitude, opposite in directions. And therefore, their torques, the torques due to internal forces will sum up to zero. What is left? The only torques that can change, the only torques that can change the angular momentum are the external torques. The internal torques cancel, and what will be left will be the external torques. A very important statement, uh, stressing what will change the angular momentum of the system, and as we saw in here, it is only the external torques that will change the angular momentum of a system. 
With this now, we are in a position to discuss the total angular momentum of a rigid body. Okay, so what we did here is we first defined the angular momentum of a particle, and then we generalized it to a system of particles. What now if I have a rigid body? Okay, a rigid body consisting of an infinite number of particles. How does this summation translate? So that's our next step. And this will be the subject of section seven. And here, or just a continuation of this, we will now find the angular momentum of a rigid body rotating about a fixed axis. Very important to state what we are considering here. It's a rigid body rotating about a fixed axis. So the situation now is as follows. We have a rigid body, like the one shown in here, rotating about a fixed axis. There is the axis of rotation. We take it to be the Z axis. And now we want to find an expression for uh, its angular momentum. That is, if I know omega, the angular velocity, and I can somehow calculate the rotational inertia, can I use these two to find the angular momentum of this body? The answer is yes. And the procedure is to divide the object into small elements of mass, particles, so to speak, each one of them has it having a mass delta mi. Find the angular momentum of the single particle and then add it up to find the total angular momentum of the rigid body. So let's first focus on what happens with one single particle. For that particle, the angular momentum of this particle, we know from chapter 10 that as the rigid body rotates, every particle will move in its own circle about the rotation axis. So with that, let's find the angular momentum of this particle using the definition of the angular momentum that we started with. So uh, considering that particle for one particle, for one particle, the angular momentum delta Li and that's the angular momentum due to just particle i, is equal to r perpendicular i cross p i, using this definition. Okay, and now we are looking at one particle with its own circle, so that's the radius of that circle, as you can see in the figure. Okay, here is r perpendicular i. And therefore, this is equal to r perpendicular i cross what is the linear momentum, mv. m of this particle is delta m. So it will be delta m i multiplied by v i. And now this is, take this out, delta m i into r perpendicular i cross vi. And if you look at this figure here, here are the two vectors, r perpendicular i and pi. The cross product of these two vectors will be in the positive z direction, and the angle between them is 90 degrees. The radius is always perpendicular to the tangent, and the velocity, which is the momentum, is always tangent to the circle. So that will simplify the matter tremendously. We don't have any angle to worry about. The angle is 90, and the direction will be in the positive z direction. So this will be delta mi, uh, delta mi multiplied by r perpendicular i multiplied by v i and this would be in the z direction. So we can now write this as delta L i z, now we know it, it's in the z direction, 
is equal to delta mi times r perpendicular i times di. And all particles will give me angular momentum in the z direction. So that makes matters simple because now you have vectors all in the z direction. It becomes an algebraic sum. And that's because the rotation is about a fixed axis. The axis itself doesn't change. If you have a situation where the axis itself rotates, then you cannot reach to the simple conclusion that we have here. So for the whole body, this is for one particle. For the whole body, what we have to do is to sum these uh, individual linear, uh, angular momenta, and that will be LZ for the whole body, capital LZ, this is for the whole body, and since all of them are in the Z direction, then the total will be in the Z direction, and that will be the sum of these individual angular momenta from the first to the nth particle, delta Li Z. And that will be equal to summation of this quantity here, delta M I, R perpendicular I times V I. Only thing I will do now is to replace the linear velocity of each particle. Remember from chapter 10, the relationship between linear and angular variables, V is equal to R omega, R times omega, where R is the radius of the circle made by that particular uh, particle, and the omega is the same for all particles in the system. So that's what I will do here. This will be equal to summation of delta m i times uh, omega r perpendicular i, I replaced v, times we have another r perpendicular i there. So compactly, this will be equal to summation delta m i, and now we have two of these, r perpendicular i squared multiplied by omega. Omega is constant, so we take it out of the summation. Now, what is this summation of m r squared? That's nothing but the rotational inertia, the, uh, the moment of inertia. So this will be equal to i multiplied by omega. And this is a very compact equation that we are looking for. Now we can write it compactly as the angular momentum of the system about an axis of rotation. Okay, here is the answer to this. There it is. L is equal to I multiplied by omega. It will have the same direction as the angular velocity. And how do we find the angular velocity again? You curl your fingers in the direction of rotation. That will be omega, and that will be the direction of the angular momentum of the rigid body. A very nice simplification of this very complicated situation. So with this now, we can make the full analogy between the rotational and angular variables. This is what we found at the end of chapter 10. We related the position, velocity, acceleration, mass, uh, work, kinetic energy, power, Newton's second law. But now in chapter 11, we added the momentum, okay, the angular momentum, and related it to the torque. And that will complete the uh, analogy or the comparison between the translational and rotational variables. That will leave us with uh, the last topic, a very important topic we have in chapter uh, 11, and that is the conservation of angular momentum. So let's go through that. We have seen this equation here for the relationship between the angular momentum and the torque, be it for a single particle or for a system, except that if you have a system, then there you only talk about the external torque. 
So, the law of conservation of angular momentum says if the net external torque, if the net external torque acting on a system is zero, that is if you put tau is equal to zero in this equation, then the angular momentum will be constant. The angular momentum of the system remains constant no matter what the changes take place within the system. So the eternal forces will not be considered. And the mathematical form of this is this one. Here is the equation for the angular momentum of a system. It's equal to dl by dt. And this, as we said, is the net external torque. So if that is zero, then this derivative is zero, which means L, the angular momentum of the system is constant, which we can write as L initial is equal to L final. So this is the simple statement of the law of conservation of angular momentum. Now we will consider an example, a very typical and classic example on the conservation of angular momentum. And that is the example of the spinning student. So let's look at that. The figure here shows a student seated on a stool that can rotate about a vertical axis. The student who has been set, so somebody started rotating the student, so the student who has been set in into rotation at a small initial angular speed omega i holds two dumbbells in his outstretched hands. His angular momentum vector L lies along the vertical rotation axis, as we said from the right hand rule, this is omega, so that's also the direction of L because L is equal to i omega. The student is now asked to pull his arms, and this action reduces his rotational inertia. We know that the rotational inertia I is equal to mR squared. So if you pull your hands toward the chest, R will decrease, and if R decreases, I will decrease. If I decreases and L is constant, then omega will increase. And that's what is happening here. The student is asked to pull his arms, and this action reduces his rotational inertia from its initial value ii to a smaller value if because of the smaller distance. So here is a, an explanation, a video of what happens. Very slow, very fast. Slow, fast. Slow, fast, and you can see that clearly in here. The explanation of this comes from the law of conservation of angular momentum. Okay. In this case, no net external torque acts on the system. The system consists of the student, the stool, and the dumbbells. If we ignore the friction in the stool itself, then there is no external force. Gravity will be along the axis of rotation, so it will not affect. And therefore, the angular momentum, since there is no external torque, the angular momentum of the system must remain constant. His rate of rotation increases markedly from omega i to omega f as he pulls his hands toward the chest. And that's because the angular momentum, what is the angular momentum? It is i times omega. So at the beginning, i is large, omega is small. At the end, i is small because the distance is reduced, so i becomes small, and therefore omega must increase to keep the quantity uh, uh, constant or conserved. The student can then slow down by extending his arm once more, moving the dumbbells outward. A very classic example on the conservation of angular momentum. Let's now take an example on the conservation of angular momentum, and we will conclude our discussion of this lecture with this example. <clears throat> so, uh, first, let's see what we have. The problem says, in the figure, an insect, okay, an insect of mass small m rides on a disc of mass capital M. This is the disc of mass capital M, 6m, and radius r. So the mass of the disc, the green area, the mass of the disc 
is six times the mass of the insect. And it is rotating. The disc is rotating this way uh, with some initial angular velocity omega i. The disc rotates around its central axis. This is the central axis at angular speed omega i that is equal to 1.5 radians per second. The insect is initially at distance small r, which is 0.8 of the radius of the disc. But then it crawls out to the rim, to the edge of the disc. Treat the insect as a particle. What then is the angular speed? So the angular speed is 1.5 radians per second. That's when the insect is here. If the insect crawls to the edge, what will be the new angular speed? Let's think of it conceptually. What will happen in this case? Nothing will happen to the disc. I mean, uh, rotational inertia wise, the, the disc is fixed. But what about the insect? If we treat it like a particle, the rotational inertia of a particle is mr squared. As it moves this way, r will increase. If the rotational inertia increases, the angular speed must decrease to keep the angular momentum at its initial value. So we expect the angular speed of the system to decrease if the insect crosses this way, and vice versa. If the insect crosses to the center, we should expect that the angular speed will increase. So let's do this problem in view in light of the law of conservation of angular momentum. And here, just to clear up the things, what we said about the angular momentum, if I have a rigid body, I'm talking about the angular momentum. If I have a rigid body, then there is nothing to use except L is equal to I omega. But if I have a particle, then I can calculate, let, let me write this because it will be very crucial for our subsequent discussion. So here is a summary of the angular momentum, okay? A summary of the calculation of angular momentum. If I have a body, a rigid body, then the only thing we have for the angular momentum is that L is equal to I omega. This is the only equation we have. If I have a particle, then I have many equations that I can use. For a particle, we have the very first definition, which says small l is equal to r cross p. And this is very useful if the particle is moving in a straight line. So this is a straight line motion like the example we did where, where we had the two particles coming this way. We can also say that for a particle, for a rotating particle, like this one in here, you can use that one, except that I will be I for a single particle. So you can say that L is equal to I omega, and I for a particle is M R squared omega. This is useful for a rotating particle like the insect we have in this problem. So keep this in mind, how do we calculate the angular momentum in the various situations. Now, let's do the problem we have at hand. To do this problem, this is a separate problem, 1106. I will refer to the disc by the letter D, and I will refer to the insect by, uh, by the letter C. So this is the insect. Let's first find Li, the total, the system, the total initial angular momentum. Well, we don't have to worry about the vectors now because everything will be in the positive C direction, be it before or after the move. So, there is no problem with the direction. It's all in the positive C direction. So let's treat the numbers. It will be I uh, of the, applying the, uh, let's first find the 
rotational inertias, I initial, the initial rotational inertia of the system is equal to that of the disc plus that of the insect initially. Note that in the disc I didn't say I or final because nothing happened to the disc. The disc is rotating without any change. And this is equal to the rotational inertia of a disc as we saw from chapter 10, the famous table 10 to is one half mass of the disc r squared plus this is a single particle it says treat the insect as a particle <coughs> so this is m r squared now let's put the numbers the mass of the disc is six times the mass of the insect so that would be six over two three m r squared plus this small r is 0.8 of r so square it that 0.8 squared is 0 0.64 0 0.64 m capital r squared so this is 3.64 m r squared this is the initial rotational inertia of the system the final rotational inertia is equal to the disk doesn't change so to remain as 3 m r squared but now the insect is right at the edge of the disk so small r becomes capital r and it this will be m r squared and that will be 4 m r squared now apply the law of conservation of angular momentum l initial is equal to l final l initial now we have rotating uh, system so it will be i initial omega initial is equal to i final omega final from which you can get the final angular speed it will be i initial omega initial divided by i final how much is that let's put it here i initial 3.64 m r squared divided by i final 4 m r squared multiplied by omega initial so take out these and you can see that it is 3.64 over 4 it is definitely less than 1 multiplied by omega i which is 1.5 so then it will be 1.37 radians per second and as we expected from the beginning, it has reduced from 1.5, it became 1.37. And this brings us to the end of our discussion of this second lecture of chapter 11. As I said, I wanted to lump all the remaining ideas other than rolling motion in this lecture. So here we discussed first the torque acting on a particle, the angular momentum of a single particle, the angular momentum of a system. We linked the angular momentum to the torque through Newton's second law. And then finally, we discussed the law of conservation of angular momentum. In the next lecture, which will be our third lecture uh, of chapter 11, we will do problems from the textbook on all the ideas that we have discussed today. Okay, today we have our third uh, lecture on uh, chapter 11, which will be dedicated to uh, the problems we, uh, the concepts we had in the previous lecture. But here is first a review of what we did in chapter 11. In the first lecture, we considered rolling motion and we saw that it can be thought of as a combination of translational and uh, rotational motion. And therefore the kinetic energy of a rolling object is the sum of the translational motion of the center of mass plus the rotational motion about an axis passing through the center of mass. 
Then in the second lecture, uh, we dealt with two main ideas, the torque and the angular momentum. First, we uh, saw how to calculate the torque acting on a particle due to a force F acting on it. And then we defined the angular momentum of a particle moving in a straight line. And then we generalized that to a system and finally to a rigid body. We linked the angular momentum and torque through the angular form of Newton's second law, which says that uh, the rate of change of the angular momentum of a particle or a system is equal to the net external torque acting on the system. Today we will do problems on these concepts which we have covered in the last lecture. The first problem we will do is about the calculation of torque. And the uh, concept in this problem, problem 23, is to see the effect of the origin. We said that if you shift or change the origin, the torque, the angular momentum will change accordingly because they are defined in terms of the position vector r relative to a given origin. So that is considered here. Problem 23 says, uh, force F2i minus 3k acts on a pebble, this is a pebble, hasa, or a pebble with position vector r, 0.5j minus 2k relative to the origin. So this is the vector r, the position vector of the pebble relative to the origin o. In unit vector notation, what is the resulting torque on the particle about the origin? So that's simply equal to R cross uh, F. And these two vectors are given in the problem. So let's use what we are given. The torque on the particle about the origin. <coughs> So about the origin, we have R as given in the problem, 0.5J, 0.5J minus 2K meters, and the force F is equal to 2I minus 3K newtons. So the torque about the origin, I will stress that with the zero there, is equal to R cross F, which is equal to 0.5J minus 2K crossed with 2I minus 3K. Now you can use the terminants or the triangle rule. This is I, J, K. Okay, and now let's see what do we have. J cross I. J cross I will give me minus K. So this will be minus K. And then J cross K. J cross K will give me I. And I have a minus sign there. So that will be 1.5 I. <coughs> okay. <coughs> minus 1.5 I. And then K cross I. K cross I will be minus J, and I have minus, so minus 4, J, K cross K is 0. So organize, it's I, J, K, so it will be minus 1.5 I, minus 4, J, minus K, Newton, meter. This is the torque about the origin. Now the problem says, what is the resulting torque on the pebble about the point with coordinates 2, 0, minus 3? We, so we changed the origin or the reference from the origin to this new point. What will be the resulting torque? So the geometry is like this. This is the origin. And here is the particle. Its position vector relative to the origin is that quantity there. Now we shift the reference to a new point P, which is given by these coordinates relative to the origin. What will be the torque on the particle relative to this point? 
So we define the position vector of the particle relative to the new point, and I will call that C. And applying the head tail method that we studied in chapter three, you can see that small r is equal to P plus C. Okay, small r is equal to, applying the head tail method, small r is P, which is the position vector of the point, plus C. So C, which is the uh, position of the particle relative to point P, is equal to R minus C. Okay, now let's see. R is given by 0 0.50 I, 0.5 J, minus 2K. This is a small r. Minus c means minus 2i, there is c, plus 0, minus minus will be plus 3k. So if you add this, it will be minus 2i plus k. Minus 2i plus k. Okay, that's the position vector of uh, the particle relative to uh, the new position. Sorry, I forgot the 0.5, okay? Plus 0.5j plus k. So the torque due to or about point P is equal to the position vector of the particle relative to P, which is C, cross the force F. So you take the cross product of this with this vector in here, use the triangle rule like we did in there, and you will find that this is equal to minus 1.5i minus 4j minus k in Newton meter. And if you compare this to that one, yes, the x component didn't change, the y, well, what's going on here? It seems that there is no change. Minus 1.5i, minus 1.5i, minus 4j, minus k. Well, strangely enough, there is no change here. So, uh, well, this is how the numbers came out, but that's the procedure to find the torque if we change the origin in the problem. Okay? So please do check these numbers, okay? Make sure that what we put here is correct. But that's the procedure to calculate the torque about any point if we change the origin. Next, let us consider some problems related to angular momentum. First, its calculation for particles moving in a straight line, for rotating particles, for a single or a system of particles, and then finally, we will see some problems on the conservation of angular momentum. So, let's start here with uh, Problem 35, which contains a very important concept, and that is the relationship between the angular momentum and torque. This is a problem from the odd edition. The problem says, at time t, the vector r, which is given by 4t squared minus 2t plus 6t squared j. So the vector r has two components, x and y component, both of which are 
functions of time. So this vector gives the position of a three kilogram particle relative to the origin of an XY coordinate system. Find an expression, an equation for the torque acting on the particle relative to the origin. Now remember that the torque is given, we saw two equations to calculate the torque. One says it is R cross F, so find the force and take its cross product with R, or the other equation says tau is equal to the derivative of the angular momentum with respect to time. And that's the one that I will be using here, but remember you can also do it that way. That's a good practice for you to do it that way. So we will start with the equation for the position, R is equal to four T squared I minus 2t, 2t, plus 6t squared j, and this is in meters. Let's find the velocity. The velocity is the derivative of r with respect to time. So this will give me 8ti minus 2 plus 12tj. That's the velocity in meters per second. And with the velocity, I can now find the linear momentum. The linear momentum is the mass multiplied by the velocity. The mass is three kilograms. So multiply everything by three, that will be 24 T I minus two times three, six, plus 36 T J. That's the linear momentum. Now find the angular momentum, L is equal to R cross P which will be the cross product of this and this. Let's see what do we have. Again, let's remind ourselves of the triangle rule. Here is I, J, and K. Okay, I want to find the cross product of this with this one. I cross I, zero. I cross J, I cross J will give me K. And what do I have? Here is K, okay, here is K. And then I have 4t squared, I have a, uh, let's be careful, i cross j is k, and I have a minus here. So let's see what do we have. 24t squared, 24t squared, and then I have 4 times 36, 144, plus 144t in the k direction, okay? And then that's about this one. Now let me take the cross product of this with this. j cross j is zero. j cross i, j cross i will give me minus. That will take care of this minus. So I have plus and now multiply. 48, 48 t times t, t squared, and then I have six times 24 is 144, 144 t cubed, and this will also be q. So lumping everything together, I don't know, I have, let me see, uh, i cross j, so I have 24 t squared, and then I have t squared t, this is t cubed, okay, t cubed, and therefore these two will cancel. And what I have at the end is, this will cancel, everything is k, and I have 48 minus 24, that will be 24 t squared k. So that's the angular momentum. The final step is to take its derivative with respect to time to find the torque. The torque is dl by dt. Take the derivative of this and that will be 48tk in units of newton meter. So this is what we are looking for. An expression, an equation for the torque acting on the particle and of course it is a function of time. Part B is the magnitude of the particle's angular momentum relative to the origin 
increasing, decreasing, or unchanging? Well, the time is always positive. So this is a positive number. The rate of change of angular momentum is positive. That means it is increasing with respect to time. And this is a very nice problem about the relationship between uh, the torque and angular momentum. And note what we did here. We started from the very basic quantity in mechanics, which is the position vector, and we got everything else. The velocity, the linear momentum, the angular momentum. Even if we like, we can find the force. Take the derivative of this, that will be the acceleration, and multiply it by uh, the, the mass, that will give you the force. So this is a very important uh, statement that we usually say from time to time. You know all there is to know in mechanics if you know the position of the particle as a function of time. Now, let us proceed. And what we will do next is we will consider a system of two particles. And we want to find the total angular momentum of the system. Okay, and that is the subject of this problem, problem 29 from the old edition of the textbook. This is like a problem we did in the, an example we did from the textbook in the last uh, lecture, where we had two particles coming this way. So here we have a similar situation. Let's read the problem. The problem says, in the instant shown uh, in this figure, two particles, one and two, move in an xy plane as shown. Particle P1 has mass 6.5 kilograms and speed V1 2.2 meters per second and it is at the distance D1 1.5 meters from point O at that instant of time. Particle P2 has mass 3.1 kilograms and speed 3.6 meters per second, and it is at a distance D2, which is equal to 2.8 meters from point O. What are the magnitude and direction of the net angular momentum of the two particles about point O? So I will turn the things as, as shown in here. This is the position vector of particle one relative to the origin, and that's the position vector of particle two relative to the origin. And let's remind ourselves that the angular momentum of a particle can be calculated in two ways, either the basic definition R cross P, this is for particle moving, for particles moving on straight lines like what we have here, or L is equal to I omega, which is M R squared omega, and that is for a rotating particle. So in this case, we have particles moving on a straight lines. We will use the basic definition of the angular momentum, and that will be uh, as follows. So this is problem 29. And the angular momentum of a particle is R cross P. So let's start with particle number one. First, its magnitude. You can see that P is in the direction of the velocity. This is R. The two vectors are perpendicular to each other. The angle between them is 90, sine of that is one. So it would be simply P, uh, R1, P1, which is M1, R1, multiplied by V1. Now, how much is that? Particle number one has a mass of 6.5. Its distance from the origin, D1, is 1.5 meters, and its speed is 2.2. So that will be, uh, that will give me a value of 21.45. 21.45, and the unit is kilogram meter squared per second. What is the direction of this now? You shift the velocity down here. You okay, shift the velocity down here and carry out the cross product. It's R cross P. So R cross P will give me a vector into the page or in the negative Z direction. So I can write this vectorially as L1 
is in the negative z direction this much in the negative z direction in the same way we look at particle number two it is m2 r2 v2 which will be equal to the mass m2 where is the mass m2 3.1 multiplied by its distance uh, d2 2.8 multiplied by its speed uh, which is equal to 3.6 so the magnitude of the angular momentum of particle number two is equal to 31.25 kilogram meters squared per second what is the direction now now here are the two vectors r and p for particle number two shift this one here and carry out the cross product r cross p r cross p will be out of the page or in the positive z direction so i can write l2 victorially as 31.25 k positive z in kilogram meter square per second so the total angular momentum of the system is the vector sum of these two 31.25 minus 21.45 will give me the total angular momentum as 9.8 k it's in the positive z direction with units of kilogram meter square per second so here is an example of the angular momentum of particles moving in a straight lines and the total angular momentum of the system the next problem is along the same lines but instead of having the particles moving in a straight line now we will have them rotating so we may use this form if we like Okay, let's read the problem. The problem says, this is problem 37 in the textbook. It says in this figure, three particles of mass 23 kilograms are fastened, tied to three rods of length 12, centi uh, 12 centimeters. So here are the three rods connecting the three particles. Each one of them has a length of 12 centimeters and negligible mass. So you don't have to worry about the rotational inertia of the rod itself. The rigid assembly rotates around point O. So the whole thing rotates about point O at the angular speed omega of the whole system 0.85 radians per second about O, what are the rotational inertia of the assembly? What is I? This is chapter 10 now. So, the rotational inertia of the assembly, if we take the axis of rotation to be about O, remember, what is the rotational inertia for a group of particles? It is summation of mi ri squared from the first to the third particle of the system. Now what do we have? They all have the same mass, so it is M summation of R I squared. This will be equal to, for the first particle, the distance from the axis of rotation is T, so that is T squared. And for the second particle, it is 2D squared, 4D squared. And for the third one, it is 3d squared 9d squared so this will be 10 plus 4 14 14 m d squared that's the rotational inertia we have the m here we have the d only thing change these to si units and calculate the rotational inertia part b what's the magnitude of the angular momentum of the middle particle now we only want the angular moment of this particle. This is a rotating particle, so you may use this one, and the angular momentum of the middle particle, L, is equal to m r squared omega. What is that equal to? The mass is m, the distance of the middle particle from the axis of rotation, here is the middle particle, 
its distance is 2D, and then you square that, that will be 4 D squared omega. And that will be 4 M omega D squared. Again, all of these are given in the problem. But see what's the magnitude of the angular momentum of the assembly of the whole system. Well, for the whole system, L is equal to I of the whole system multiplied by omega. What is I of the whole system? That's what we calculated in the test step, 14. So take that, multiply it by omega, and that would be 14 m omega d squared. That's the angular momentum of the system about uh, 0.0. So this is a very nice, simple problem, just to remind ourselves how to rotate or how to calculate the angular momentum of a rotating particle. The next problem we will consider is uh, problem 39. This is really a very comprehensive problem, very comprehensive problem, because it has all the ideas we have studied in chapters 10 and 11. Very nice problem. Let's read it. It says, the angular momentum of a flywheel, here is a flywheel, uh, having a rotational inertia I of 0.14 kilogram meter squared, the angular momentum of this wheel decreases from 3 to 0.8, so L initial to L final in a time of 1.5 seconds. What's the magnitude of the average torque acting with the flywheel about its central axis during this period? So we are given the change in angular momentum. We want to calculate the torque. So the relationship, as we saw, is through Newton's second law. And the equation says, the equation says, tau is dl by dt. If I just want the average, which is what he's looking for, then it becomes delta L by delta t. If I want the magnitude of the average, then I would just take the absolute value of this. So tau average, is equal to L final minus L initial. L final is 0.8, L initial 3, divided by the time for this change, which is 1.5 seconds. So the average torque is equal to 1.47, the magnitude of the average torque, 1.47 Newton meter. Then the problem says, assuming constant angular acceleration, big hint, through, through what angle does the flywheel turn? Knowing the angular acceleration, what is theta? Use the equations of rotation with constant acceleration that we studied in chapter 10. Only thing is we have to find what is this angular acceleration, and that comes from Newton's second law, which says tau is equal to I alpha. So alpha, is tau over i. Tau is 1.47, and i is there. It's given in the problem, what is the rotational inertia? 0.14. So that will give me alpha as 10.5 radians per second squared. And this is constant. Let me calculate omega initial at the beginning of the decrease. How do I calculate that? That's the equation there. So omega initial is equal to L initial over I. L initial is three over I 0.14, and that will give me omega initial as 21.4 radians per second. Now I can calculate theta, and theta, I know we are still in part B, Theta is equal to omega initial t plus one half alpha t squared. Okay, now we have it both. Omega initial is there. Alpha is there. The time t is 1.5 seconds. Put all of this into together and this will be 20.3 radians. So this is the angle by which it rotated during that deceleration time. How much work is done on the wheel? Well, remember that constant angular acceleration 
means constant torque. If I have constant torque, then I can calculate the work as tau times theta. Always make the analogy with linear motion. In linear motion, if I have a constant force, the work is equal to F times D, the force times the displacement. Now in angular motion, ta, uh, the force is replaced by the torque, the, dis, the linear displacement is replaced by the angular displacement theta, so here you have tau, and here you calculated theta, multiply by the two, and that will give you 29.8 joules as the work done on the flywheel. What is the average power? Well, the average power is the work over time, 29.8 divided by the time, 1.5. That will give you the average power. And if you put the numbers, this will be 19.9 watts or roughly 20 watts. That's the average power done on the wheel during that time. So here we have uh, uh, these problems about the calculation of torque, the calculation of um, angular momentum for particles moving in a straight line or rotating, the relationship between torque and angular momentum. Now we will come to the last part we discussed in the chapter, which is about the conservation of angular momentum. But before we deal with these problems, let's remember what we did in chapter nine with regard to conservation of linear momentum. There we applied the concept or the law of conservation of linear momentum to two types of problems. Explosions, like when we have uh, an object that suddenly explodes into so many fragments, and the question is, find the velocity of one of the fragments after the uh, explosion. Or when you, for example, fire a bullet from a gun what is the recoil speed of the cannon or the gun? These are explosions. The other place where we apply the conservation of linear momentum is in the study of collisions, be it one-dimensional inelastic, one-dimensional elastic, or two-dimensional collisions. In that case, in chapter nine, in all the collisions we discussed there, the particles were moving on straight lines before and after the collision. If the particles were rotating and then colliding as they rotate, linear momentum will not be helpful. So we have to consider the conservation of angular momentum, and that's what we will see now. So here are the problems to which the law of conservation of angular momentum can be applied. These are the type of problems that you can come up or come across. One example we saw in the last lecture was that of a spinning student pulling his hands in and out. Another example of, uh, is where we have a particle moving radially, like the insect moving to the edge or to the center. Or uh, when you have uh, something moving on the rim, like when you have a wheel and something starts to move on the rim of the wheel, if the object moves this way, the, the wheel will move in the opposite direction and you have many exam problems like this. Or when you have a person standing on the edge of a circular disc and he throws something, the recoil is the disc will go in the opposite direction. This is like what happens here when you fire a bullet, except now it is linear. In that case, it will be circular or rotational motion. Another example is that of a shrinking sun. What happens if the sun shrinks to half its initial size, what will be the effect of, on its period? There you can apply the angular momentum and all of these can be found in exam problems. The other place where you can apply conservation of angular momentum is in the study of collisions, but now when the particles have rotational motion, not just linear motion. So let's look at some problems involving the law of conservation of angular momentum. And we will start here with problem 49 from the textbook, which says the following. Problem 49 says two disks, and I added this figure to illustrate the idea, 
Two discs are mounted like a merry-go-round on low friction bearings on the same axis. So they are, the two discs are mounted on the same axis. It can be brought together so that they couple and rotate as one unit like you see in the bottom. The first disc with rotational inertia, 3.3 kilogram meter squared about its central axis is set spinning, rotating counterclockwise at 450 revolutions per minute. The second disc with rotational inertia, 6.6 kilogram meter squared about its central axis is set spinning again counterclockwise at 900 revolutions per minute. They then couple together, like we have here. And the question is, what is their angular speed? One of them had 450, the other one is 900 individually. Now, when we couple them, what will be the angular speed after coupling? So here we will apply the law of conservation of angular momentum. And it will go like this. We don't have to worry about the directions now because before the coupling, all of them are in the counterclockwise direction. And after we couple them, the direction doesn't change. So we don't have to worry about the vectors here. Everything will be in the same direction. Let's work out the angular momentum. Before the coupling, L initial, L is the total angular momentum, is the, the one for the first disk plus the one for the second disc before the coupling. How do we calculate L for a rigid body? It's I omega. So it is I one omega one initial plus I two omega two initial. And let me put the numbers. This is 3.3 .3 I one. Its angular speed is 450, okay? And for the second one, it is 6.6, .6, rotating at 900 revolutions per minute, and that will give me 7425. The unit is a bit strange. It's kilogram meter square revolution per minute. Let me keep it that way. Kilogram meter square revolution per minute. Finally, they become one object rotating with a final angular speed omega final. So it will be one object, total rotational inertia, I1 plus I2, one object rotating with some final angular speed omega final. What are these? 3.3 plus 6.6, 9.9 9 omega final. Now apply the law of conservation of angular momentum, which says L initial is equal to L final. Again, no vectors because they are all in the same direction. Before, it is 7425. After, it is 9.9 .9 omega final. So omega final after the coupling is equal to 750. And I, I will retrieve the same unit. That's why I didn't change it here revolution per minute. So it is somewhere between the two, okay? Like the average, the weighted average of the two. Part B says, if arrested, the second disc is set spinning clockwise. So now we have two rotating in opposite directions, one counterclockwise, the other one clockwise. If the second disc is set spinning clockwise at 900 revolutions per minute. What will be the angular speed after the coupling and the direction of travel? Now here we have to watch the signs. So we will split them. L1 initial, it is rotating counterclockwise and it will be I1 omega 1 initial. Counterclockwise means plus and it is 3.3 .3 multiplied by 450. So that will be plus 1485, the same unit as we have here. L2 initial, 
is equal to I2 omega 2 initial, which will be 6.6 .6 multiplied by minus. It is clockwise now by 900 revolutions per minute, and this will be minus 5,940 kilogram meter square revolution per minute. So L initial, now add them algebraically with the signs we have here, L1 initial plus L2 initial, and that will be equal to minus 4455 kilogram meter square revolution per minute. L final is like we have it here, they couple as one object, rotating with some final angular speed, so 9.9 .9 omega final. Now apply conservation of angular momentum, L initial is equal to L final, so minus 4455 is equal to 9.9 .9 omega final, and therefore omega final is equal to uh, 450, Okay, for minus 450 revolution per minute. Okay, the minus here means the final system will rotate clockwise, will rotate clockwise, and that is its uh, final angular speed. So, this is an example of uh, the conservation of angular momentum. Next, we will look at a problem involving collisions and rotational motion. And that would be problem 67 in the textbook. <clears throat> Let's read the problem. The problem says the figure here is an overhead view of a thin uniform road of length 0.6 meters. Here is the road of length 0.6 meters and mass capital M rotating horizontally so have a good imagination of the problem we have the rod and the rod is rotating horizontally in this plane we may see a problem where the rod is rotating vertically but now it is rotating this way and there is a particle coming in a straight line and hit it as it rotates hit it as it rotates that's what we have here so it is rotating counterclockwise, if you look from the top, it is rotating counterclockwise at that angular speed. About an axis through its center. So it is rotating this way, about an axis through the center. A particle of mass m over 3, so the mass of the particle is one third the mass of the rod, and traveling horizontally, horizontally means this way, here is the rod, and that's the particle coming this way. Everything is in the horizontal plane. Traveling horizontally at speed 40 meters per second hits the rod and sticks. So it hits the rod and sticks to it. The particle's path is perpendicular to the rod at the instant of the, hood, uh, of the head. So when the rod becomes horizontal this way, at that instant of time, the particle hits it here. The particle's path is perpendicular to the rod at the instant of the head at a distance d from the rod center. At what value of d are rod and particle stationary after the head? So we want to hit the particle at a certain distance d from the center so that when they collide, they stop each other. At what distance can we get that condition? So here we will apply the law of conservation of angular momentum. We have a collision. Before the collision, we have two moving objects, the particle moving in a straight line and the rotating rod. After the collision, they stop. So the final angular momentum is zero. Applying the law of conservation of angular momentum, we want to find the distance d at which the two collide and stop together. So let's calculate the angular momentum of the particle, of the rod, add them victorially and equate the total to zero because after the collision, nothing will be moving. <clears throat> the 
This is now problem 67 from the textbook. In my solution, I will refer to the particle by P. So P refer to the particle and R refers to the rod. I hope we don't have any symbol with R. Okay, so let's find the angular momentum of the particle before the collision. The particle is moving in a straight line. If a particle moves in a straight line, the only thing we can use is R cross P. Okay, and this is equal to R cross M V. So this is, take the M out, M into R cross V. Where are these vectors? And we are talking about the instant of the collision, just as they collide. Here is the velocity, the particle is coming that way, and that is the vector R, from the particle to the axis of rotation. It goes from the axis of rotation to the particle. What is the cross product of these two? That would mean that first of all, they are perpendicular to each other. The angle is 90, sine is, is 1. What is the direction? Shift the velocity down here so the two vectors have the same origin. And now what we need is R cross V. R cross V will be in the negative Z direction. So that is the direction. And therefore, the initial angular momentum of the particle, we have to deal with things in vectors now, is equal to MRV, they are perpendicular to each other, but it is in the negative Z direction. So minus MRV in the negative Z direction. And how much is this? The distance at which the particle hits the rod is what is called D. That's what we want to find. So this is minus MVDK. Okay, V we know it, that's 40 meters per second. The mass of the particle is one third the mass of the rod. So let's put that here, minus MVD over three K. That's the initial angular momentum of the particle. Now let's look at the rod. The rod is a rigid body, so capital L, I, R the initial angular momentum of the rod. Before the collision, the rod was rotating counterclockwise, so its angular momentum is in the positive Z direction. How much is that? It's I omega. Okay, so it will be plus I of the rod omega before the collision, and it is in the positive Z direction, I R omega I. Do I have omega? Yes, 80 radians per second. What is I now? The rotational inertia of, uh, of the rod. I don't know if we have the table. Well, we saw that in chapter 12, uh, show, sorry, chapter 10, the big table, 10 2. What is the rotational inertia of a rod? Rotating about its center, go back to that table, and you will find that I calm of the rod is one over 12 m l squared. So uh, that will be, let's put that here, that will be plus m is the mass of the rod, m l squared over 12, and they have omega i in the k direction. I hope I have it all, m l squared over 12, omega i k. Okay, now I have I don't have M, but it may cancel. L is 0.6 meters, omega I, 80 radians per second. Okay, so the total angular momentum before the collision, just before the collision, is the sum of these two, LIP plus LIR. Add them together, they are both in the K direction, so it will be ML squared, omega I, over 12 minus capital M V D over 3 K. After the collision, nothing is moving. 
So the final angular momentum just after the collision is equal to zero. Now apply the law of conservation of angular momentum. Li is equal to Ln, which means that this whole thing is equal to zero. M L squared omega i over 12 minus M B D over 3 K is equal to zero. For this to be zero, this bracket must be zero, which means that this is equal to that. So M L squared omega i over 12 is equal to M V D over 3. Cancel the mass. And remember what we want is the distance D of the hit. So D is equal to 3 over 12 is 1 over 4. Okay, what else do we have? 1 over 4. And then we have L squared omega I. L squared omega I divided by V. Divided by V. Sorry, this is 1 over 4. Okay. 1 over 3 over 12, 1 over 4, L squared omega I over V. Now we have L, L is 0 0.6, omega I 80. The initial speed of the particle is 40 meters per second. Put it all together and you will find that the distance D that will stop both of them is equal to 0.18 meters. Okay. Now, part B. In which direction? Do rod, uh, now, the, the idea of part B is the following. If the particle hits the rod at exactly this distance, they will stop each other. If it hits it at any other distance, they will not stop, and they could go counterclockwise or clockwise. So the problem says, in which direction do rod and particle rotate if D is greater than this value? If, if the particle hits the rod, at a larger distance. They will not stop, they will keep rotating. They stick together and rotate. Will they rotate clockwise or counterclockwise? We'll look at what we have here. Look at this bracket. If I increase the distance D, then I am increasing this term in here, which is the negative term, which will be clockwise. So if we look at, if, if we hit at a larger distance, the two will rotate clockwise after the collision because it is the particle that will have the stronger effect. If I hit at a smaller distance, they will stick together and rotate in a counterclockwise direction. So that is with regard to this uh, angular collision. The last problem we will do is another collision. It's like the previous one. Okay, problem 53, but this is from the old edition. It's like the previous one. Again, we have uh, a rod. We have a particle hitting the rod. But now, contrary to the previous problem, in the previous problem, the, the particle hit the rod at 90 degrees. Now we hit it at, uh, at some angle. In the previous one, it was hitting it at some distance. Now we hit it at the edge. So let's see what do we have. The problem says a uniform thin rod of length 0.5 meters and 4 kilograms can rotate in a horizontal plane. Again, we are rotating here about a vertical axis through its center. The rod is at rest when a 3 gram bullet traveling in the uh, rotation plane is fired into one end of the rod, as you can see in the figure. As viewed from above, the bullet's path makes an angle of 60 degrees with the rod, that's the angle theta. If the bullet lodges, penetrates and sticks, lodges in the rod, and the angular velocity of the rod is 10 radians per second, immediately after the collision, what is the bullet's speed just before the impact? So compare this to the previous one. In the previous one, the two were moving, and then they stopped. In this one, the rod was stationary, and after the collision, it starts rotating. So what will be the angular speed, not the angular speed. We are given the angular speed. What was the speed of the bullet before the collision? So the situation is like this. Here is the initial velocity of the bullet just at the 
moment of the collision, of course, I shifted that there. And here is the initial position vector of the bullet <coughs> at the instant of the collision. Of course, you can again shift that there to carry out the cross product. So, here is the situation before the collision. <clears throat> this is 53 from the old edition. And before the collision, it's only the bullet. So L initial is that of the bullet, which we can write as L initial is equal to R cross P, which is R cross M V, which is M into R cross V. Now, where is the direction of this? It's in the positive Z direction. And after the collision, uh, of course, they, they will stick together and move like a unit. So after the collision, it has to be counterclockwise. Okay, it has to be counterclockwise. And this will be equal to uh, the magnitude of this L initial is equal to M M R V sine of the angle phi between R and V. Here is R and here is V, and the angle between them, as you can see, is equal to theta. So this is M R V sine of theta. How much is this? This is equal to the mass of the bullet before the collision. We only have the bullet moving. So 3 grams, 3 10 to the minus 3. What is R? R is the distance at which the bullet hits the road, which is half of the length. Do we have the length? Yes, 0.5. Half of that is 0 0.25. 0 0.25. Sine of the angle is 60 degrees. And then we have VI. It is this quantity that we want to find. The initial speed of the bullet. So this is equal to putting all the numbers, uh, substituting sine 60, this is 6.5 times 10 to the minus 4 times Vi. After the collision, what do we have? We have the bullet sticking to the rod and the whole thing is moving like a unit. Now we have a rigid body the angular momentum of a rigid body is I omega. What is I? It is I of the rod plus I of the bullet. But now let's make sense of it. What's the mass of the unit? It's three grams. The mass of the rod is four kilograms, 4,000 grams. So yes, you can do exact calculations, but if you ignore the bullet compared to the rod, that's not really a big error. Uh, 3 compared to 4,000 is less than 1% of a difference. So after the collision, I will just ignore the bullet, ignore its mass compared to the rod, and just treat it like a rod rotating with some angular velocity. So it will be I of the rod multiplied by omega final. What is I of the rod? Again, this is a rod rotating about its center, 1 over 12. M L squared omega final. And that will be 1 over 12. Do I have the mass of the rod? Yes, 4 kilograms. L squared, 0.5 squared, 0.25 multiplied by the angular speed after the collision, that's 10. So putting all these together, this is 0.833 kilogram meter squared per second. And just to remind ourselves, this will be counterclockwise, okay? To be equal to the thing before the collision. Now apply the uh, law of conservation of angular momentum. 
L initial is equal to L final. So we have 6.5 times 10 to the minus 4 initial speed of the bullet is equal to 0.833. And from here you can get the initial speed of the bullet as equal to 1,282 meters per second, an extremely high speed of uh, the initial bullet, the initial speed of the bullet. <clears throat> and that uh, is the second problem we have with regard to uh, angular collisions. Of course, you can do more problems if you like. You can, for example, look at problem 65 from the textbook, analyze the vectors this way, except now be careful if you want to do this problem, the rod, we have a rod that is rotating in a vertical uh, plane, where does it say? To attach to the ends of a thin rod, uh, the rod is free to rotate in a vertical plane, so the rod is rotating now this way, and when it is horizontal, at this instant, when it is horizontal, this piece comes down and stick to it, and then they rotate together. So the question is, what will be uh, the angular speed after the collision, and what is the ratio of the kinetic energy of the system after the collision, and through what angle will the system rotate? They will rotate to some angle, and then come back. This is really a challenging problem, okay? So if you have the time, and mood, and mentality, go ahead and look at this problem. And that brings us to the end of chapter 11, our second chapter and final chapter on uh, rotational motion, which again we discussed rolling motion, torque, angular momentum, and conservation of angular momentum. These are the four main ideas we had in this chapter.